my quest to feed the world began in June of 2012 when I stepped off the smallest plane I had ever boarded onto a hot red Indian tarmac in Aurangabad. I was greeted by my driver in a string of unintelligible words ending in, you look tired, Mara Butcha. But more important than my disheveled journey was my final destination. And after 40 minutes of dodging cows and cars on the wrong side of the road, I arrived at Maiko, an offshoot of Monsanto, and yes, I did say Monsanto, in rural northeastern Maharashtra. After working in Monsanto, in a country in dire need of agricultural solutions, yet in constant fear of what's going into their food, I realized I wanted to, to, to strive to understand food in general. To do this, a colleague and I hopped on a plane and headed to Delhi to consult the foremost opinion on agriculture in India. Once inside the agricultural minister's office, we were invited to sit in the worn leather chairs before his desk. The meeting went on for about an hour, but it felt like the blink of an eye to me. I was never once addressed by anyone, but the topics being discussed soaked in through my pores and hardened my determination. This was my stuff. GM foods, feeding the world, educating the consumer. This is where I belonged. With all this in mind, I became agitated. How could the one man who knows more than any other the need for bright, young hunger fighters not recognize the one sitting right in front of him? More importantly, how can one man properly mandate what everyone in his country is allowed to eat, possibly sentencing some to suffer as he bans GM crops? And so, all this going through my mind, and immediately after this picture was taken, I lagged behind the others. With a nerve-stealing breath, I said, Mr. Minister, and thrust out my hand in the most Americanized uh, manner I could muster. And um, for what seemed like eons, my words hung in the air like ghee on a roti. Everyone froze, the room was silent, until finally, Sharad Pawar, agricultural minister to the second most popula populous country on earth, looked at me. He slowly grasped my hand as I gave three hearty up-downs and quickly turned to leave. But I like to think his eyes followed me all the way down the hall. Similarly, my passion for those without enough food has followed me ever since, even up on stage today. Many things can be taken from this story. But what sticks with me is that the foremost authority on agriculture in India does not see GMOs as a viable way to feed his population. Then who would really? It's easy and right to be skeptical when leaders are constantly telling us that GM foods are bad, toxic, or unsafe. After working at Monsanto during the summer and observing the need for new and better seeds, but also the public opinion, I now realize my support of GM foods is in contrast with the rest of the world. My hope is with my speech today to incite within you a similar realization. If we are what we eat, then what are you? To begin, I'd like to outline for you two biotechnologies I find particularly promising. The first is genetic modification. The second is marker-assisted selection. And to begin, I'd like to lay some groundwork. All living things base their characteristics on some form of DNA or RNA. It's the specific code of these base pairs, and a simple example of which is shown here, that establish everything about any living thing, right down to its cells. It's these same coils of genetic messiness that separate corn from, say, a jellyfish. But life on Earth today is dramatically different than it was even 100,000 years ago. Who's to say, in a billion years, some strain of corn won't have become a jellyfish? This sounds crazy, but let's do some calculus. Envision that each year, a set of environmental pressures is applied to corn. Now also envision that this set of environmental pressures selects for a specific subset of genes each season. If we take the limit, as years go to infinity, of corn, then it seems as likely as anything else that corn will approach being a jellyfish. Now, I understand this example is bizarre and disturbing, but many critics deface genetic modification for doing something unnatural. 
when in reality, those same sequences that scientists insert into, say, tomatoes, might as well have occurred randomly in nature with enough generations. Why then would we not create the best crops here and now, instead of waiting for nature to perform the same operation? But that's just it. We live in 2014, where countries are fighting constant battles over man's right to manipulate what, na what nature has mandated. Meanwhile, 800 million people are fighting simply for their next meal. GMOs have perhaps the greatest potential to alleviate hunger in far-flung or remote regions. But the biggest downfall to this technology is that most of the world views it as unnatural. Most statisticians believe by 2050, there will be 9 billion people on this Earth. If we cannot currently feed the population we have now, how do we hope to feed 9 billion by 2050? That's where the second technology comes in. Marker-assisted selection, or MAS, could be biotech's answer to the world's reluctance to adopt genetically modified crops. To explain how it works, I'd like to start with a metaphor. As a rule, everyone loves to play with the dogs at Petland. Now let's say you finally want to dive in and get yourself a puppy. Without interacting with the dog, there's no way to know if it will be a loyal love or a royal regret. Now let's say that you could know, beyond a reasonable doubt, that all dogs with brown ears, such as that one, would be friendly. Wouldn't you then narrow your search to only those dogs? Now let's say you're a farmer, and you want all of your seeds to have a trait, for instance, drought resistance. Currently, the trait clusters on DNA, called trait loci, which are clumps of genes close together, are very difficult to identify until a seed is planted, grown, and then the farmer can observe the physical manifestation of the trait. Now let's say that as a farmer, you could know which seeds would be drought resistant before even planting them, without having to pluck the ones that don't fit the bill. In other words, just as knowing that dogs with brown ears helped you weed out unwanted dogs, MAS helps farmers weed out unwanted seeds before having to plant them. To understand marker-assisted selection, you need to understand two key points of information. The first is that Gregor Mendel said that genes recombine randomly. This is only sort of true. In fact, the likelihood that one gene and another piece of DNA will be transferred to the next generation together is proportional to the distance those two segments are apart on the chromosome. Basically, if segment A is right next to segment B, it's almost certain that they'll be passed on to the next generation together. The second point is that genes are surrounded by non-coding regions of DNA. These are nonsensical and often full of patterns, making them very easy to identify. Combining these two concepts, MAS is the ability of scientists to find these easy, patterned, non-coding regions next to a gene that they're looking for, thus identifying beyond something like 99% certainty whether the seed they have has the trait they're looking for. Here we have compared the pedigree method, or traditional agriculture, with marker-assisted selection. As you can see, they both begin with the same number of seeds, but by F4, Marker-assisted selection has half the number of, of um, product, progeny to choose from. This means that they're 50% closer to the final product. And by F7, both methods have produced a line of seeds where 99% of the seeds have the trait they're looking for. But marker-assisted selection has done it in less time with fewer resources. I, th I think that genetic modification and marker-assisted selection represent the future of food. But why should I, or anyone else for that matter, care about food when there are already systems in place, such as health inspections, that claim to guarantee the health and safety of us as consumers? Well, just because it won't kill us doesn't mean we should eat it. Yet, when I sit down to eat, I often don't consider what's in my toast or even my salad. And after a long day, I feel like 
I would eat just about anything as long as it were, uh, as long as it tasted and looked like a healthy meal. The reason I am so passionate about hunger and food insecurity is that I believe as human beings, we should have a close relationship with what we consume. This goes far beyond calorie counts in the debate of carbs versus fats and ends at the most fundamental feature of foods, molecules. We eat molecules because we are made of molecules. And if I learned anything in organic chemistry last semester, it's that one tiny difference in a molecule can mean life or death. Genetic modification, marker-assisted selection, and any agricultural technology alters the molecules that will end up on our plates. And as we stick our fork nonchalantly into that sweet clump of chemicals, we take a bite of what will ultimately become us. Literally, the things we consume become the building blocks of our cells, our enzymes, our bodies, and if you're an infant, your mind and personality. But why should everyone in this room, and on Earth for that matter, care about biotechnology and genetic modification? The food system is giant. And as human beings that have to eat and also participate in that system, it's inescapable. What happens to the supply of food in the US not only affects prices around the world, but the problems, defects, technologies, benefits found in those kernels will become the brains and bodies of people everywhere. So here's what I propose. Basically, be a skeptical omnivore, eating freely, not abandoning the system, but at each and every meal, considering why the things on your plate will make you a better, brighter, healthier individual. If genetically modified foods are a part of that picture, great. If you think your health is at risk due to scientific tampering, even better. Find more that agree with you and educate yourselves together. I propose marker-assisted selection as a good way to alleviate hunger around the world due to its quick, easy use of traditional techniques. Why? Because everyone deserves food. As Norman Borlaug, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and the man attributed with saving more lives than any other person that ever lived once said, food is a moral right. If we all take the time to consider food, how to savor it, how to make it safe, how to spread it around, then I know we have the ability to see Dr. Borlaug's vision to fruition. Hunger is a problem. We need a solution. So know what you're eating. Tell your friends and fight hunger. Thank you.